Well, thank you very much for having me here to talk on the Programming Tools track. Um, I get an opportunity to share with you the sort of tool that um, I like to use to do, and I think it, it's kind of undervalued. It's not necessarily uh, used well enough or actually being used anywhere near its potential. So what I'm going to look at is Jeb. And the first thing to demystify, I think, is the word apocrypha, as in what, apocrypha what? What it's all about, why this word? Well, I didn't know. The title wasn't mine. It was suggested by a good friend of mine. And so I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the answers for that were that it's either of dubious authenticity, which would be unfortunate, and so I started to wonder what my friend was implying. Secret or non-canonical? Well, it's starting to move in the right direction, but I'm not trying to keep things secret. And finally, I hit on one that worked, which was obscure. So we're going to be looking at some of the obscure features of Jeb. So in the beginning, we had the book of Jeb. Now, first of all, when you do a search, you may encounter this particular book of Jeb, which, whilst being an absolutely wonderful book, um, is also something that may end up making your head feel a little bit like this, or even like this. And if you are, and if you find your head is starting to feel like that, then you maybe you've hit, hit, hit the wrong book. What I'm referring to is the book of Jeb. Now, the book of Jeb is a great online manual for how to use Jeb, but unfortunately, whilst it was being developed and put out there, it has been somewhat um, ignored. Certain aspects of it have been ignored in favor of other aspects. And so I'm going to try and throw a light on those aspects that I think have been downtrodden for far too long. OK, at the same time as Jeb being developed, we're also looking at building things such as JUnit and some of the madness that was ensuing after, the, after JUnit's usage. Instead, this was JUnit was then becoming Spock, which is where sanity reigns. Here we have a, a, Spock, a Spock definition that's very similar to the JUnit definition, and I think you can understand the simplicity and the clarity that it contains. Unfortunately, Spock and Jeb led to what well, can only be described as a That's plenty enough of that, thank you. Um, yes, it, it was a tragedy, in that people assumed, implied, that you needed one with the other, because it was too tempting. It was tempting to have J or Spock and unit testing and the testability of websites and Jeb's ability to automate the usage of said websites. So unfortunately, people had taken the book of Jeb and focused very much on the first feature, the A1 number one feature, which is this idea of web testing. And unfortunately, they hadn't got much further than that because it was so compelling. What we've got is people using a lot of Jeb for web testing and never getting any further along in the line in the definition of what Jeb is for. OK, so what I'd like to do is dispel the fact that people think Spock and Jeb are some way closely related. That that Jeb is in some means a child of Spock, it is not. It should be taken in isolation. Oh. There's something, but people think it's an inheritance relationship, it certainly is not. Please don't. If you can take one thing away, it's that Jeb is so much more. And please have a plan, you have a go with it. Okay, so I'm focusing on everything else beyond web testing primarily. And so, my hope is after today's talk, there will be a new hope for Jeb. Jeb. For automation. Yeah, enough of that. Whoa. There we go. Now, that's enough of the graphics and music for this morning. <laughs> if anyone had too much coffee beforehand, I'm sorry. OK. So this is a little diagram. I've talked about it a few times. I'm going to use this diagram, the life preserver, to explain the code I'm going to look at. So I'm going to write a very small Jeb script. I'm not going to write it because these guys do typing freeform in talks. I can't. So instead, I'm going to show you some code and basically gloss over it and say, it works. It's on GitHub. I will point you at it. Okay, but the idea here is I have a little script that is doing something incredibly important to my life. It is going to search for all the Chuck Norris references on a couple of different search engines. And because I am pretending for the sake of this talk that they have no REST API, I'm going to have to screen scrape. Unfortunately, I have to dirty myself with that particular technique. So in the core of my life preserver, I have my search for Chuck. That is my job. That's what I'm trying to do. 
Uh, so that's what it looks like. We're still not complicating the diagram too much, hopefully. We now have some integration sources. I have some components that are going to need to talk to different search engines to get my Chuck answers. OK, so I have my Google equivalent. And there's a few things to point out on these. I have my pages. I'm using the page object pattern, very familiar to people who have used Jeb at all. It's a wonderful way of encapsulating and hiding away the intrinsic complexity of working with a particular vague source, such as an HTML page. OK, so I've got my Google one. I've got my Bing one, because I'm interested in answers that are duplications. And I'm going to also use Postel's Law, which I've mentioned a couple of times. How am I using Postel's Law? Whenever I introduce Postel's Law into a conversation, it gets confused. I don't know why. It just does. Uh, maybe it's me. Postel's Law, for me, is being very, very flexible in what you accept and trying to be rigorous in what you give out. That's a very small summary. And when I'm talking about something coming in and going out, I'm talking about the form of something. We talked to, I talked to a gentleman a couple of nights ago about this. The form of something, not necessarily the actual data types involved. You can still be rigorous in the data types you accept. Um, in my case, Postel's Law really isn't a complicated implementation. Uh, it's basically being flexible about what I accept from the page and trying to find a bunch of elements that I match upon. So anyone who says <coughs> implementation of Postel's Law is complex needs to use Jeb or Selenium, arguably. OK. Um, so I have my HTTP sources. They're looking good. That's how they look on the Live Preserver. Let's move on. We need some more. We need something else to my system. We need some dependencies. Unfortunately, Jeb is a dependency. It's something else I'm going to need to use. It's a nice little library, so why don't I grab that? Uh, I'm going to use a wonderful little tool called Grape. Because what I'm doing is writing a little script. You're going to see a common theme, I think, to the talk today, of writing little scripts that do one thing and they're really helpful and can be chained together. Here, I'm just writing a little script. So what I want to do is say, yes, I have dependencies. Sorry about that. But I can declare them and go and grab them from a repo um, with a little bit of config inside my um, scripts. OK, so now I've added my dependencies. Well, I've added my dependencies. Because unfortunately, I can't spell. And then the last thing I have to do is configure things. So yeah, I'm going to use Firefox just for the heck of it. So I have a configuration domain, the bottom, that is another integration domain. It's an integration between my core, my search for Chuck, and the outside world, which in this case is my configuration. So I have a Jeb config. And I'm done. OK, that's it, to write a nice little script that does some screen scraping, gets some information, does something with it, and then you can happily chain it together because it will be using standard in, standard out, and I'm sure someone, some other people this morning will be talking about how wonderful that is too. So a little programming tool gets me going quickly. In summary, Book of Jeb. Jeb is about so much more than just testing. It's a great tool for working with all sorts of different sources particularly HTTP, HTML sources that you want to then parse out as appropriately as possible. It's not just about Spock, although Spock is wonderful. And I could have done just a session just on Spock, because it would have been fun. The source code is there. Don't worry. I'm sure the slides will be available at some point, so you won't need to note it down. The important part is trying to remember how to spell apocrypha. Once you've got that down, the rest of it is relatively straightforward. If you want the diagram, I have it. You can even get my spelling mistake. And there is a whole bunch of additional techniques around this sort of thing inside the book I'm writing on LeanPub. Warning, the book's in alpha. Alpha for me means I have titles. Um, <laughs> but it, and it's very much fluid and, work and changing almost every day. But if you're interested in it, it's up, it's out there. Thank you very much. I don't know how long that was, but that is me done. Thank you. <laughs> that was 10. Wow. Questions? Yes, questions. <laughs> Why not? One question. Yeah.